Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending today's Zoom webinar. This is part one of the three-part lecture series, Free Expression and Education. And in case this is your first Alt-Liberal Arts event, Alt-Liberal Arts is a nonprofit education initiative partnered with the Open Society University Network, Bard College, and PEN America that provides virtual alternatives to fill the gaps created by censorious legislation that is impacting what can be taught in our classrooms. Uh, my name is Sophia Brown, and I am a community outreach coordinator working with PEN America to support free expression initiatives in Florida's public colleges and universities. I am also a recent graduate of the New College of Florida, and here in my neck of the woods, we've seen probably some of the more stark and disturbing examples of legislation meant to censor our classrooms over the past few years. Uh, between the aptly nicknamed Stop Woke Act and Don't Say Gay Bill, uh, we've seen that state legislators are making it increasingly clear that they aim to exert control over how and whether topics race, gender, sexuality, and American history are taught to our students. Um, it's it's a bit of a scary it's kind of a scary time to be an educator, a parent, or a student. That goes without saying. Uh, but here today to tell us more about what it means to have the freedom to learn in our current political climate is Jonathan Friedman, the director of free expression and education programs at Penn America. At Penn, he oversees research, advocacy, and education related to academic freedom educational gag orders, book bans, and free expression in schools, colleges, and universities. Uh, he has served as lead author on several PEN America reports, um, some of which include the 2022 report banned in the USA, the growing movement to censor books in schools. Uh, there's the 2021 report, educational gag orders, legislative restrictions on the freedom to read, learn, and teach. And there's also the 2020 campus free speech guide. He oversees Pan America's Free Expression Advocacy Institutes for Youth. And uh, just two weeks ago, he also testified at a congressional hearing on book bans uh, and did a spectacular job, if I might add. Uh, Alt Liberal Arts is very excited to be hosting this lecture series, uh, which will have part two and part three over the next two weeks as we continue this conversation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan in just a moment, but as he gives the presentation, you are all invited to use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have, and we'll reserve the final 15-20 minutes to go over and answer them. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Sophia. It's great to be here. Um, so uh, for those uh, who are new to the topic, um, freedom of expression has a fascinating history uh, and a tremendous amount of contemporary relevance. So I'm going to try and uh, articulate for you all today really what I think of as a, a framework, a conceptual foundation uh, for understanding this topic. All right, free expression and education. What do we need to know? So what are we talking about and where are we talking from? I think it's important to have some sense of it. Um, for those who don't know, PEN America is a hundred year old nonpartisan membership organization. It was founded in the wake of the First World War uh, when journalists, poets, writers, uh, uh, originally PEN stood for poets, essayists, and novelists, came together uh, with a, a set of shared ideas about the role of the writer in society. Um, you think today about the role of social influencers and others who are in positions of um, uh, well, power. Um, long ago, there was an idea that there was the responsibility of artists and writers to try to make the world essentially a better place um, through promoting the freedom of expression, promoting cross-cultural understanding and exchange, and the idea that even during times of war, you know, the world should be open to um, culture and the arts. And those ideas are foundational to how we approach um, turbulent times in the world. They are also very much a part of how we have thought about issues related to freedom of expression on college campuses and in public schools in the United States. So if you want to read a minute our charter, our kind of founding charter, which was um, written down before 1948, but really became um, memorialized at that time, it's that Penn is committed to dispelling all hatreds, 
um, and working to champion the ideal of one humanity living in peace and equality in one world. We also stand for the unhampered transmission of thought, and that is not unrelated to the idea of um, a more peaceful or democratic world. Um, it is very much, those notions in our work are really closely interrelated. Although today you will hear on a lot of campuses and in other places, people um, frequently putting free speech and diversity, equity, inclusion, and pitting them against one another. In our work, we don't necessarily uh, believe that those two values must necessarily be at odds. In fact, we think that it is necessary for colleges to be both open to a wide variety of ideas and to instill and guarantee a kind of shared and equitable sense of belonging for all students. Um, now, interestingly, we also have a um, line of work around freedom of the press where we talk about opposing arbitrary censorship and opposing the evils of a free press such as mendacious publication deliberate falsehood and distortion of facts for political and personal ends. And I just raise that here because um, it's, it, I think it shows the staying power and uh, the relevance of uh, Penn, uh, despite being, you know, a very old document. So in our work on college campuses, which is now in its uh, sixth year, um, we do um, convenings on campuses, we do workshops, we do research reports, we have done a great deal of media commentary and uh, advocacy, we do public panels, and we also do programs uh, for student audiences. Um, you can find our advice for students, for faculty, and for administrators contained in our online and free resource, the Campus Free Speech Guide, and also um, our writings on uh, a wide range of freedom of speech issues on college campuses in various reports. So what is free speech and what is free expression? And here I want to uh, just help you to understand if you don't have a grounding in this area, you know, what are people talking about when they talk about these? Um, one thing that's worth noting uh, at the get-go is that these terms are, for many people, increasingly interchangeable. In the United States, there's a stronger tradition of talking about freedom of speech. Uh, it's a kind of American cultural um, preference. Uh, but often in, Amer in the American context, what people are talking about as free speech isn't just speech alone. Um, they are talking about, for example, the decision to light a flag on fire as a form of speech or to follow someone on Twitter as a form of speech. Um, around the rest of the world, there is more of a distinction where free speech is really just speech acts, you know, verbal forms of expression. But free expression is a broader idea, you know, gender expression, uh, artistic expression, etc. But as I said, the words and the concepts can be somewhat interchangeable. Now, what's key, though, when we're talking about it, whether we call it speech, whether we call it expression, right, we're talking about how people um, express themselves, how they articulate ideas, how they share information. And the notion of free speech is not just, you know, how the individual interacts with the world in terms of being heard, but also how the inter how the individual uh, intakes information. So the right in the United States is sometimes referred to as the right to seek and receive information. Uh, you'll also find that in uh, human rights language. But the key to understanding this is that actually, whether you want to or not, we all have to make decisions about free expression, and we make them all the time. In fact, what we're really talking about when we talk about free speech isn't necessarily uh, what is what kind of comments and in what kind of contexts um, we're allowed to say things, but rather what set of principles are we going to apply to essentially draw the lines OK, the rules, the boundaries, um, the punishments for seeking and giving out information. And and if we kind of imagine uh, a spectrum here of societies and we can think about this applying to uh, a family unit, a uh, school, a university, a democratic, you know, polity, etc. Um, we have implicit in all of these social arrangements, an idea of when we're allowed to do things. So, you know, when kids go to grandma's house, they know that maybe they're not supposed to say certain certain things. They're supposed to behave a certain way. There are words maybe they don't say. Um, they are acting uh, in that society or in that social situation with the notion of what the rules are. And at the abstracts, we can imagine um, the possibility, at least, 
of living in a society in which we have total free expression. So we can say whatever we want, whenever we want, to whoever we want, however we want. Or at the other end, total regulation. And the question isn't necessarily, you know, do we want to live in, you know, do we all want to move to an island that's total free expression or we want to move to the other island that's regulation? Really, the question is, you know, what are the rules that we're going to come to, the compacts around how we draw these lines in our society? And over time, different people have pushed or advocated for um, more regulation or for less regulation, for more freedom or less. And what's interesting is is that the history of this is often actually forgotten today in our context now, that um, there are many people, especially over 100 years ago at the end of the 19th century, at the end of the 1800s, who at that time were more pro-free speech. They wanted greater freedom, greater um, opportunity to speak. Some One example is uh, Frederick Douglass, who as an anti-slavery abolitionist spoke in one speech about um, his plea for freedom of speech in Boston after a speech of his that was anti-slavery was uh, shut down, canceled, and the and the whole um, place where it was to happen, um, uh, a, a riot broke out and he was unable to speak. So he said in his speech after that, that in effect, slavery, quote, cannot tolerate free speech. Five years of its exercise would banish the auction block and break every chain in the South. Emma Goldman, uh, 50, 40 years later, when she was uh, deported uh, at her deportation hearing, um, she spoke about free speech as well. Now, Emma Goldman, you may know, was an anarchist, uh, an early feminist. Uh, she was um, ultimately deported from the United States to the Soviet Union uh, for her speech. And she, at her deportation hearing, took the opportunity to talk about free speech. And she sort of called... Um, called the U.S. on its hypocrisy. She said, you know, every human being is entitled to hold any opinion that appeals to her or him without making herself or himself liable to persecution. What becomes of this sacred guarantee of freedom of thought and conscience when persons are being persecuted and driven out for the very motives and purposes for which the pioneers who built up this country laid down their lives? So a stinging rebuke, in a sense, of um, why people ought to be able to speak. Now, in uh, Goldman's time and in the era, many people who gravitated towards pushing for greater free speech were also, in effect, pushing against some kind of regulation. Uh, one kind that uh, had become broadly enforced was the Comstock Act, which had been passed in 1873 in the U.S., which made it illegal to send, quote, obscene, lewd or lascivious, immoral or indecent publications through the mail. But the way that the law worked in practice was that one person, Anthony Comstock, actually had the um, basically jurisdiction to search through people's mail in case what they were sending uh, met his own personal definition of these concepts. And he was given an incredible amount of discretion to determine when people were breaking the law. One of the groups that he targeted, among others, were early um, birth control activists, women like Margaret Sanger, who circulated pamphlets trying to teach other women about um, uh, about uh, birth protection, you know, how to not get pregnant, etc. Um, and he deemed that their effort to spread that kind of information was obscene, lewd, lascivious, and immoral. Now, today, um, the Comstock Act is no longer in force, but nonetheless, we are facing another moment, another movement of people to um, redefine and and regulate um, uh, the uh, circulation of information, particularly information about sex. And so we are reminded, I think, in many ways of this past time uh, when um, we see these issues kind of boiling up, particularly around young people in schools. Now, the question then is, all right, if we want greater free expression, um, what what are the trade-offs? I mean, if we um, can imagine a more um, free society, greater freedom, we're talking about a place where there's greater individual liberty, um, how that free expression and the opportunity to spread ideas is itself a means of catalyzing social change, that free and open inquiry can breed you know, new forms of um, investigation, new truths about the human condition. Uh, think about uh, famous scientists like Galileo who were punished for their uh, scientific inquiry into the universe. You know, the idea and the hope is that 
today in the United States, that wouldn't happen, that our paradigms and scientific understanding of things um, can be open and, and flexible to change. Um, it also makes it easier to spread information when you live in a society that has greater total free expression. But what's the trade-off? The trade-off is that it becomes also easier to spread information that you or people who agree with you um, might find offensive. Maybe other people don't. But that kind of information in particular, hate. You know, there's a famous 1970s free speech case that went all the way to the First Amendment, which involved a group of neo-Nazis who wanted to organize a protest in an area of Illinois, Skokie, Illinois, where a number of Holocaust survivors lived. It became this question, did the local government have the right, and, and basically was it their discretion, to stop this group of people from organizing this public protest and rally? And ultimately, uh, the case was taken up by the ACLU and won, um, meaning that they were allowed to, to march. Now, why is that? It's because many people in the ACLU at the time and in the history of this have seen how granting the power to stop people from protesting, granting the power to um, uh, take away people's rights ultimately gets wielded against you know those who are pushing for social change. And many um, black civil rights activists of the era had, you know, also fought against such regulations in the South in particular when um, people's in positions of authority were trying to stop them from marching. And so the hope was and the idea was that by defending even this group's rights to organize a march, it would allow other groups. But now we deal with the legacy of that, and that is that in the United States in particular, hate is you know permitted a great deal to circulate. And this becomes a challenge for schools, it becomes a challenge for universities, it becomes a challenge for you know democratic and, and equal society. But the challenge is that if we are going to regulate hate, we have to figure out how we're going to do it. And as we move right on this spectrum closer to more regulation, if we want to regulate hate, we have to ask ourselves, well, what powers are we going to give to the government to do that? And in state after state around the world where we see governments tighten their power to punish people for speech, whether that's hateful speech or anti-nationalist speech or you know, lewd and lascivious, obscene speech, whatever it is, those rules are often abused and wielded against political opponents. They, we're talking about societies where there is authoritarianism, where there is no independent press, where propaganda is more common and we are have a regulated culture sector. And these are the kinds of countries where an international human rights org like Penn and others do a great deal of work. Uh, we're talking about situations like the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, a journalist in Saudi by uh, the Saudi government, or the imprisonment of a rapper, Valsero, in Cameroon for uh, rapping that the government was killing the country's children. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about filmmakers who might be imprisoned for their criticism of uh, the government, the way that Oleg Sensov here on the bottom left was imprisoned in Siberia for his criticism of Putin. Or on the bottom right, uh, uh, two journalists in Myanmar who were arrested after reporting on the Rohingya uh, Muslim massacre of a few years ago. And so in each of these cases, um, we've seen what happens when societies flex towards greater regulation. Even, let's say, it, 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 not in any of these cases, but there we can imagine ones where people might be acting with uh, more um, good faith, you know, in trying to regulate speech, but nonetheless can bring about the conditions that lead to greater suppression. So we're talking about less individual freedom, state control of ideas, uh, the suppression of minority views, and more propaganda. So the question is, well, which way should we go with this? How do we solve this inextricable problem of free expression or regulation? And Believe it or not, we have a solution in the United States, and it's called the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is one potential solution, and really a set of solutions, um, that have developed here to solve and give an answer to this problem. Now, part of that has to do with the unique judiciary set up in the United States, where uh, Supreme Court justices consider cases, they consider precedent, they uh, evaluate what kinds of regulations are allowable. And the First Amendment itself was written in the wake of a revolution. So it was written by people who valued freedom of speech because they had just used those freedoms in order to circulate ideas, well, critical of the government at the time, the British, right? So they said, Congress shall make no law 
uh, that has to do with respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably of uh, people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, what's key here is to just zero in on the idea that you can make no law about uh, restricting the free abridging the freedom of speech. Now, that isn't actually the case anymore. Over 200 plus years, that has evolved more or less into an understanding that you can make some laws, but those laws have to be narrowly tailored. They have to be what's called reasonable. They have to demonstrate uh, a reason for existing, a government interest in um, um, uh, controlling some sphere of the circulation of speech. They have to demonstrate that they are laws in some cases that will restrict the least amount of speech in the interest of uh, supporting the government. And in each case, um, the laws themselves have to pass certain tests, but ultimately might be understood as demonstrating that they are neutral laws, viewpoint or content neutral, meaning that they aren't laws that are being written to suppress particular ideas. They are laws like, for example, that anybody um, can't uh, walk around campus with a bullhorn uh, late at night because people want to sleep. You know, there's an interest um, by many people um, that's not ideological, that it has nothing to do with one particular view in um, having peace in um, evening hours. So, you know, these are often called time, place, and manner restrictions. You might encounter them on college campuses and, and in other places. Um, but it's also important to understand that the First Amendment in the United States only applies to public institutions. Um, so private institutions are not directly uh, subject to them, although a lot of private universities in particular nonetheless do uphold pretty strong protections for freedom of speech um, at the same time. Now, as the idea of the First Amendment and its protections against laws has evolved, what, you've, what we've ended up is essentially a legacy whereby there are some cases of speech that are determined to be unprotected by the First Amendment. So these are mostly cases where speech is not just a set of words, it's not just a, an offensive word, it's really a you might think of as situations where speech becomes a form of action, um, harassment or incitement to imminent lawless action, um, obscenity, defamation and libel, true threats, child pornography. So these are limited, specific, uh, elaborately defined and, and well articulated exceptions to free speech. But what's critical to understand is that the vast majority of speech does not fall into any of these categories. And that in the United States, the Supreme Court has a long history of weighing, you know, the pros and cons of allowing a form of censorship through law to pass. And inevitably, what they have done is really try to keep these exceptions narrow, specific, and, you know, low in number. And in a number of cases where there have been contentious questions for them, you know, ultimately, although sometimes in five to four decisions, they have tended to side with speech. Um, Justice William Brennan said, quote, government may not prohibit the expression of an idea because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. So in Tinker v. Des Moines, uh, that case was about students wearing armbands to protest the Vietnam War to school, to high school. It was determined that those students, quote, do not shed their rights, their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gates. It's a very famous decision. But what it means is that high school students, just as they're in high schools, still have First Amendment rights. They still have some free speech rights. And um, that has led to subsequent decisions in the high school realm, but it opened up a kind of new area, a new question. Well, you know, how could teachers run their classrooms? How could principals discipline their students if students had free speech? And so, you know, the case really became about a particular form of political speech and protest in a school, but nonetheless had significant... Um, uh, significant implications for the ways that schools are understood as places where students do have rights today. Um, another colorful case, Cohen v. California from 1971. This case is about um, the F word and whether you can wear it uh, on a patch on your jacket if you're going to serve jury duty. And in this case, it was determined basically, quote, that one man's profanity is another man's lyric. In, in other words, that banning a particular word or punishing people for using it 
was a form of ideologically motivated incursion on uh, speech and that therefore it should be allowed. Now, in the past you know 50 odd years since this decision, um, what we have seen is that the language that is used by people in everyday uh, in le- everyday interactions, in movies, and songs, and books, is now much more full of, I don't know, what we call cuss words or other um, language than it maybe once was, but it is in part uh, from um, a decision that allowed that speech more broadly. Um, Texas v. Johnson, uh, this is about a um, the right of somebody to burn a flag, and here it was determined that that right is protected, that that is a form of freedom of speech. And interestingly, this case draws on a um, uh, a number of cases, a kind of lineage of cases in which um, Supreme Court justices have said that they wouldn't want to live in a country where patriotism was enforced on people, you know, so that it would be better off for people to appreciate the liberty of being in a free society where they could burn a flag and that that itself would allow them to appreciate or embrace Um, what was distinct about the United States in the world, that we were unlike other countries that might enforce more strict rules against things like flag burning itself. Finally, a case, Snyder v. Phelps, that had to do with the protest of um, funerals for gay soldiers, where ultimately it was determined that even though the protesters here were trying to intentionally inflict emotional harm on the families of gay soldiers who had served in the army and died, that it was still their free speech right to do so. So as you can see in each of these cases, you know, the the ultimate um, direction of the interpretation of the First Amendment has been, um, although not in every case, but certainly in these, towards greater free expression, right? Towards being very concerned and skeptical about empowering central regulations of speech. Now, this idea has been so powerful, in particular in the United States, that when the UN was being founded and when the entire universe of international human rights was built, uh, it was built on um, uh, ideas that had their origins in the United States and that had been kind of hailed as new kind of global conventions. So if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights uh, from 1948, Article 19 says, quote, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. And you can see that idea actually reflected in a series of conventions in international human rights law, uh, whether we're talking about um, the rights of people to uh, partake in cultural life or uh, rights of people to thought and conscience. Um, In convention after convention, we see this standard really enshrined as very much a bedrock piece of international rights, an idea that, um, you know, all people benefit from living in societies where there is greater openness and greater exchange of ideas. So now how do we solve the problem of hate speech, which I had brought up earlier? Well, I think what's key to understanding this is that there is no singular universal definition of what constitutes hate speech. Usually, when people are talking about hate speech, they're referring to some conception from the United Nations that it's uh, more or less a kind of communication that is um, that uses pejorative language, either uh, in a discriminatory way or in a direct way, to people based on aspects of their what we might call like ineffable identity, religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender. Um, these are a variety of identity factors that you know people um, uh, that have been the source of stereotypes for you know time immemorial, let's say. But in the United States, even though there is a UN definition of hate speech, in the U.S. there is no category of speech that is punishable for its hateful content alone. So, as uh, Nadine Strawson has written, a former president of the ACLU, speech cannot be punished just because of its hateful content. When you get beyond content and look at context, uh, and then she goes on to explain the particular context in which speech that is hateful but does more than is it's 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 doing something right. It's speech becoming action. It's not just um, words being directed at people. So she says, if in a particular context that speech causes certain specific imminent serious harm, a genuine threat that means to instill a reasonable fear on the part of the person at whom the threat is targeted that he or she is going to be subject to violence. So here we're talking about when speech moves 
um, uh, from um, uh, when speech moves from being um, uh, speech, you know, that might be denigrating to a particular person in a very general sense to constituting a kind of direct threat against a particular person. Now, the notion of hate speech also, why, why not regulate hate speech? Why not have stronger rules against it? Well, in part because the notion of hate speech is very easily weaponized. If you look at the language from Donald J. Trump, for example, when he was president, he was talking about Black Lives Matter uh, itself as a form of, quote, um, as a symbol of hate, a form of hate speech. So if you create a set of laws that allow people to be easily imprisoned or punished or um, fined, let's say, for their for the specifics of their remarks and do not consider the context around it, what you do is you create a situation where it's very easy for people in political power to say that those who criticize them are engaging in a kind of, well, hateful rhetoric. And, you know, just take, you know, one example, like any of the, um, um, you know, we're seeing this on college campuses right now, where there are a number of cases in different parts of the country where um, speech that is, you know, most likely protected by the First Amendment, nonetheless, is being heard by other people as hateful. And there is often a desire to punish it. But what's critical in understanding these cases from a legal perspective, from the perspective of the First Amendment, is to understand that the, these cases, if they aren't including genuine threats, if they don't rise to the level of what legally constitutes harassment, then they are free speech because hateful speech, hateful invective is not itself illegal. And, you know, this is what protects the free exchange of ideas, particularly in the political sphere, where people are often satirical. A lot of comedy, you know, uses um, um, uses insulting remarks for the sake of generating um, a reaction from an audience. You know, sometimes even polit politicians might speak off the cuff and say something very offensive against a group of people, but we wouldn't want to create a situation where they are subject to uh, punishment for saying something hateful to be determined by, um, you know, some other government authority, because that would create a weapon that is um, very powerful and used to suppress speech. And so because of this, you know, Nadine Strassen um, has a book that I encourage people interested in these issues to read, which is called Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, where she talks about how um, censorship of hate speech, quote, no matter how well intended, has been shown around the world and throughout history to do more harm than good in actually promoting equality, dignity, inclusivity, diversity, and societal harmony. And so what does this mean for people who want to combat hate what does it mean to use uh, counter speech rather than censorship? Well, it means being more creative. Uh, for example, in one case in uh, Germany from a few years ago, there was a group of neo-Nazis who was coming to march in a town, and uh, the, the people in the city essentially created a charity where they would um, donate more money to the national group that fights neo-Nazis, depending on how many Nazis or how far they marched essentially in town. So they created a situation where uh, this group who was coming with a quite hateful message, you know, if they came, they would essentially be raising funds for a group that fights them. And if they didn't come, well, then they were doing the work of the group that wants to to fight them as well. Um, at Middlebury College a few years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a speaker coming to campus who was seen as homophobic or misogynistic by a group of students they planned a pro-LGBTQ protest outside of his event. When the university leaders ca canceled his event, um, the students got at first blamed. There was, it was seen that they had essentially caused his event to be canceled, but they insisted that they were going to peacefully protest. And they also got upset at the, at the college leaders for canceling it, saying that it had deprived them of their opportunity to engage in counter speech um, and, uh, you know, host their counter event. And so I think in both of these cases, we can see that there are advantages to um, coming up with more creative ways of engaging with speech we don't like rather than directly trying to censor it. So, you know, counter protesting, counter messaging, etc. And there are many such examples from college campuses in recent years, um, though there are also cases where people have felt that the only recourse in the face of speech that they dislike is to shout it down or cancel it from happening. I think what we're seeing right now is how 
when you shut down speech, inevitably, you inevitably sort of give some power to that speech. You can turn people into martyrs. You can give them kind of greater oxygen to say that they've been censored. But if you find other ways of um, counter speaking to them, um, you can avoid that from happening. And in some ways, you can actually do a more be more effective at, at stopping their message from getting out. A lot of the time, efforts to censor something only kind of give it more power and more um, uh, win behind its sales. So why then, you know, as we think about freedom of speech, you know, in 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 this kind of spectrum, why side with speech? Why is speech more important to side with than um, efforts at regulation? And I think it's not, although I listed here, it's the law, First Amendment, but it's more than that, right? It's about this inalienable um, universal human right. It's about a humanistic um, right or, or need that all of us have to express ourselves. There is a, an artistic piece of this where, you know, if you want to draw a drawing or do a dance or make a song, we have all experienced at some point in our lives the power of creativity unleashed and, you know, inevitably censorship and suppression of ideas, um, the chilling effect um, that is caused through um, societies that make everyone too nervous to speak out or raise the bar of punishments to speaking become very problematic and inevitably over time impact that artistic and humanistic need as well. There's a, a democratic rationale for freedom of speech that has to do with the um, ways in which democracy is strengthened through debate and through the opportunity to evaluate ideas. I think it is also very much true that um, free speech has been part of every major movement for social change, which has benefited from the free exchange of ideas in order to call for, you know, injustice to be undone, for uh, people to take action, for people to have the frameworks, language, history, understanding of uh, past injustice and to be rallied behind it. And then finally, free speech is really critical in this um, skepticism of government, which was I, I was talking about earlier, this belief that, you know, if we give a set of new powers to regulate speech to some central authority, you know, it might get out of control or we might not know where it can go. Now, what does all of this matter to free expression and education? And um, I'll be talking about this more in the next two sessions, but just to preview it a little bit, I think that this approach allows us to understand why in public institutions in particular, um, the, the protections for the circulation of knowledge are so critical why we must have public libraries where people can read books, why we must have universities where people can ask new questions or challenge ideas or, or engage in academic debate, why we must have schools where teachers must be free to um, try to answer students' questions or direct them to trusted resources and not feel like there are certain questions they can't answer, certain books they can't um, make available to students. Um, and we have to, in each of these cases, and I'll be talking about this more in future present in the future sessions of this, we have to draw a distinction between banning content, censorship of content, and the choices that um, are at the professional discretion of teachers and librarians and other education professionals. It's one thing to say um, you cannot, you know, give some kind of information, education, knowledge out in the world. It's another for someone who has the power to make those determinations to do so, to say, well, I thought it was more important that students learn X than Y, or I have found that this book or this resource is a more effective way of educating this topic than that one, and we're, and we're kind of shifting, we're, we're moving in that direction. So choosing not to teach certain material is not at all the same as censorship when we're talking about official suppression, right? State governments or other... Uh, positions of political authority determining the bounds, right? The ideas of what is allowable to be learned, to be considered, to be thought about, to written about, to expressed and shared with others. So that's why I think we must have free expression and education. And uh, I look forward to continuing uh, the conversation in uh, Q&A and as well as in the next uh, two weeks. So I'm going to stop uh, my share here and uh, move us into the Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that super comprehensive presentation. I feel like I learned something as well. Um, for our audience members, we're going to, for the next uh, 12, 13-ish minutes, we're going to be dedicating this time to answering questions. And it's still not too late to drop your own questions uh, in the Q&A function. 
Um, to get us started, we have one question about, uh, we have an anonymous attendee who is asking about um, two recent examples of sensory speech that they would like um, you to comment on or to provide some insight. Uh, the first, and I'll, I'll do these one at a time. Uh, the first is the defunding of Palestinian student groups at state universities, and especially in Florida for protected speech. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this through the framework of, of free speech that you've laid out for us today? Um, yeah, I think that in terms of student groups on campuses, there has been unquestionably an effort to um, wield the government power in Florida in particular uh, against a group called uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, SJP. Now, this isn't the first time that student groups have found themselves in hot water. On many campuses for a long time, we have seen um, many controversies surrounding um, uh, surrounding the formation of student groups or the calls to dissolve or de-recognize student groups. I think what's key is in any kind of decision, when we're talking about a knowledge institution, an education institution, a university, school, et cetera, what is the process being followed and how is it being stuck to? So in this case, you have a claim that is being made, I believe, in Florida that these chapters of this national organization have in some way contributed to material support for terrorism and material support for um uh, for Hamas, and Hamas is identified as a terrorist group by the United States government, and that's how they kind of make the connection. But what they're not really proving is what material support, um, um, what material support is actually taking place. You know, speaking about your belief in a cause, an international cause in the United States is speech. That's not support in some way of material support. Usually material support means giving money, giving weapons, or giving expertise. Uh, there's a case where it's been determined that that can be included, but none of that constitutes material support. Then there are also questions about exactly um, whether, you know, one, let's say that there was a national group who was doing this. If you had a student group on a campus, would they necessarily um, be, in a, be immediately implicated, let's say, in that? You know, like we're talking about something that's a very discreet act. Um, but it seems quite hard to suggest that just because maybe something was said over here by a national group that every student group and every person in those student groups, you know, ought to be banned from associating with one another at public universities. So that's, that's a bit of a jump that's taking place there and it's highly concerning. Um, and it would be highly concerning if that were being done against, you know, any student group just because of, you know, political rhetoric being, being hot. It doesn't surprise me because we have for many years now already seen the current government in Florida uh, move to try to suppress uh, certain speech. And often they do similar things. For example, you know, what's called the don't say gay law in Florida, which um, despite requests for clearer language to be part of that law to make it um, clear to audiences and, and teachers in particular where the line is around what kind of content is available you know, they have not. And so this is already a government that has engaged in kind of efforts to chill speech. This appears to be another one. OK, thank you. Um, the second example that this um, attendee would like to know more about or to to hear your thoughts on um, this is this isn't one I'm personally familiar with. But um, yesterday's censorship of the release of the Nashville Shooters Manifesto um, does this seem to you as to be a violation of at least the spirit of free speech? Where might something like this fall on the spectrum that we uh, we spoke about earlier? So I think we're talking here about the effort to censor this speech on the, the, the content of this manifesto on social media. And social media right now is in a place where the rules around censorship are shifting and not always um, it's, it's not always clear. Now, there is an argument to be made that social media is different, that the speed with which people can get information or the unvarnished way with which people can get information, you know, without um, a warning about whether what you're looking at, for example, is true, false, etc., cetera, um, means that social media requires greater friction, greater warnings, greater um, information to come accompanied with information that you intake. Um, the, in terms of the decisions that are made by 
um, social media companies, these are usually decisions that are being done by what are effectively private entities. And that has meant that they are harder to regulate from the perspective of the First Amendment. So from a strict uh, kind of um, uh, the strict like legal First Amendment point of view, it's harder to say that uh, Twitter or Facebook or what are effectively private entities need to be held to a higher standard. But this is an area that is still being debated. And I can tell you that for every case where, you know, let's say it's just clear misinformation that's being censored, um, you know, um, uh, wacky ideas about the world, the world is flat, whatever it is, you know, we have to have a high bar for any kind of censorship that we're allowing. And a lot of this attitude towards not allowing people to see content has also led to um, new kinds of restrictions or just the disappearance of other kinds of content from the internet that might be of tremendous educational value. So one of these that comes to mind is um, YouTube, uh, which took down a set of videos that were videos, kind of archival footage from the Holocaust, because it was determined that those videos and their content, which, you know, are quite heavy, you know, it's an offensive, strong, difficult topic. Um, and there is some question about, you know, how readily that content should be available to anyone who has, you know, a keyboard and a computer screen. But nonetheless, the disappearance of it from the Internet does raise similar questions about what ought to be the protections for that kind of information being widely accessible. In other words, you know, is the Internet, I don't know, the worldwide open marketplace of ideas or is it something else? And increasingly, it is something else. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I have another question here. Um, do you have any thoughts about the role that therapy language plays in these issues, um, if any? For instance, when students might say that a particular reading uh, traumatizes them or it might traumatize others and therefore should be suppressed, to give an example. Um, I think that, you know, that there is no question that this this kind of language, the notion of like trigger warnings has become more common um, and and expected, I think, among some students. But a lot of the research on this has shown that giving people, quote unquote, a trigger warning doesn't necessarily like prepare them to better deal with content. I think is particularly in like um, um, uh, certain kinds of like performances and artistic expression, the power of provocation, the power of surprise is part of the experience in order for it to have, you know, the, the I don't know, expected effect on an audience. I think also um, we are too often seeing people use the language of what I would call the language of harm as a form of suppression. So that harms me, therefore you shouldn't be able to say it. And I think that is the wrong approach. I think the answer can be, you know, that harmed me or that upset me or that did, you know, had an effect on me. And therefore I'd like you to consider whether you understood that that would have that effect. Maybe you wanted to have that effect on me. Or maybe you've never heard from anyone like me before that those words have those effects. And you might consider how you might be conscientious with your words in the future. I think all of that is in the realm of like dialogue, understanding, um, peaceful coexistence, pluralism. None of that is censorship. Um, but so often right now, this sort of expectation that um, uh, um, uh, uh, this expectation that um, that you know, people should have an experience of campuses or other interactions without anything, you know, upsetting them, I think is is quite concerning because actually a lot of material in the world is upsetting. And that's a standard, particularly when we're talking about topics like history. We can't set our students up for um, situations where um, where they expect not to be upset. Uh, it, it, it's just sort of undermining the value and potential of education. Thank you very much. I, I think we've got time for one final question. And um, this attendee first uh, says that they appreciate your answer regarding the Nashville Manifesto and social media. And they follow this up by asking, are you at all concerned with the release of the Twitter files showing that the government demanded speech be removed from Twitter that was inconvenient for the government? Uh, what do we make of this in the framework of free speech? You know, I think there are really serious questions here about like what is the role, what is the appropriate role of the government with regard to the regulation of um, speech on social media. And so 
on the one hand, we recognize these are private providers and therefore they're not going to be subject to the First Amendment. On the other, they seem to be, you know, still potentially subject to certain kinds of regulations or pressures from government. And this can lead to situations where they might be acting in, in ways that aren't necessarily in the service of, you know, democratic expression for all. And I think that where we have seen um, more people participating in social media, we have seen, you know, dif diverse and different effects. You know, we think about something like uh, the role of Facebook in the Egyptian revolution, um, but you can also think about the rise of um, trolling and uh, doxing and other forms of attacking today in the United States. And so um, there's also, you know, a lot of people who are looking at the cognitive impacts of cell phones and smartphones and social media on young students, on teenagers, you know, the, the, the generation that's only ever thinking about um, how in, you know interactive life computes to Instagram. So I think that there are a whole lot of unanswered questions in this area that are very much unique to our contemporary moment. And um, I think out of this moment is going to come some kind of new consensus about how, how this all ought to work. Um, we're just not there yet. It usually almost inevitably takes some time for uh, new technology to interact, particularly when we're talking about the circulation of information with you know, existing law and existing culture and existing norms until a new kind of way in which these areas of uh, communications are regulated emerges. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're just about out of time. I'm going to ask you in just a moment if you have any closing thoughts for us. But before I do, I would just like to remind our viewers that uh, once again, this conversation will be continuing next week on the 14th, same time, uh, same place, and then the following week on the 21st. Uh, next week on the 13th, we are also featuring part two of our supporting LGBTQ plus youth in the Don't Say Gay or Trans Era lecture that will be continuing next week as well. And on the 15th, we are also being joined by Maya Wiley, who will be giving us a lecture on the assault of critical race theory. So we have a lot of fascinating events coming up very, very soon. Um, and I hope you're all looking forward to them as much as I am. Um, Jonathan, do you have anything you'd like to say to close this off today? Well, so today's session was really about laying the foundation and giving an, a kind of broad understanding of freedom of speech. Um, what we'll be talking about in the next session is a focus on K-12 schools, uh, issues related to book bans and educational gag orders and other efforts to suppress the freedom to learn, um, uh, many of which we've seen in Florida. And then in the final session, we'll be focused on higher ed, um, talking about academic freedom and students' rights issues and the like. All right. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, thank you very much again, Jonathan, for joining us today, um, for speaking with us, for sharing your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I think that just about covers it. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your evening, Jonathan. Yeah, same to you. Thanks, everyone.